What does the term software engineering mean to you? For many people, it means either a rigid, overbearing, bureaucratic approach to software, or it simply means programming. I think that both of these are wrong. In other disciplines, engineering means the stuff that works and is nearly always rooted in a deeply pragmatic, scientifically rational view of the world. So if your approach is overly bureaucratic and doesn't allow you to build better software faster, then it surely doesn't qualify as engineering. Defining software engineering as only programming is rather like defining aerospace engineering as only welding. Only writing code is not enough if we ignore requirements, design, testing, deployment, monitoring change in production, and everything else that's involved in delivering useful products and services to people, then whatever that is, it's certainly not software engineering either. So what is software engineering and why does it matter? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel, and if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe, and if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They've been supporting the channel, so please do check out their links in the description below. This week is rather a special one for me. Last Monday, the electronic version of my new book, Modern Software Engineering, was published. I've been working on this book for a long time, and it explores some ideas that I think are important, not just for me, but to help us all do a better job of software development. So in this episode, I want to explore some of these ideas, ideas that I think should define software engineering and that should be the starting point, the ground rules for all of the choices that we make when building computer systems. I also want to explain why I think this is important to doing a good job. As an industry, we have misunderstood software development in a profound way. In the past, I've called this a trillion dollar mistake. We've completely misunderstood what software development is. As a result, we've applied completely inappropriate approaches to building software very often. The history of human production has been focused on and constrained by the production of physical things. Understandably, that's, those are the only things that we made for a long time. If I want to make a teapot or an iPhone, sure, the design process is interesting and challenging, but the really complex part is scaling this up so that I can make thousands or millions of them at an appropriate price to an appropriate level of quality. As products of industrialized civilizations, we see this as so normal that it's often difficult to see past it, even when it isn't true. And for software, it isn't true. Software is unique in that for us, we don't have a production problem ever. Unless we're doing something really dumb, that is. For us, production means cloning the sequence of bytes that represent our system. And we can do that perfectly, and this cloning is so cheap that it's essentially for free. However big or complex our system may be. The fact that our products, our output is a sequence of bytes, is a profound difference that has several interesting, unique consequences. If production is free, it means that the difficult part of our job is the design, and only the design. Ours is an intensively creative discipline, and we don't often think of it like that. This attribute has been passed on now to other digital things. Technically, if not always legal, legally, we can copy any digital information, books, songs, movies, photos, anything for free, as long as it's digital. That ability comes from computers and their software, and before their invention was pretty much unthinkable. This has some fascinating consequences. It means that ours is fundamentally, primarily, a discipline of exploration and discovery. If it costs nothing to copy the product of our work, then we'd be really dumb to ever do exactly the same thing twice, because we could have it for free. So once we've learned what the problem is and how to solve it, and how to use the tech that we chose to solve it appropriately, then we're essentially done. We don't need to do that again, ever. 
because to do so would be a waste of time, effort and money. We may want to revisit it and change it as we learn more about the problem, but we'll come on to that. We may choose to repeat things for fun or to reinforce our learning. But for commercial reasons, if we want to do the same thing again, we clone those bytes. In fact, we even organise our designs to be flexible, to be used in different contexts using this ability. After all, what is an operating system other than a collection of services that we all rely on? In the early days of computing, nearly every programmer wrote their own version of many of these services. So, if production is never our problem, then our real focus is one of exploration and discovery. Then to become good at it, we need to become experts at learning. What does becoming an expert at learning mean? Well, we have a very good guide for that. It's called science. Science is all about learning and discovery. So we software engineers should take lessons from science and adapt them and apply them to our discipline. Now, when I say this, I think it's easy to misunderstand what I mean. Science and engineering are not the same, but they are deeply related. Engineering is more practical, more pragmatic than science. I think that there are five things that characterise a focus on learning for us. The first two are iteration and feedback. We need to work in small steps so that we can gather feedback that tells us whether we're making progress or not. This is by far the most effective way of making progress. If we set ourselves some target that we'd like to achieve and then work iteratively, gathering feedback that tells us after each small step whether we are closer to or further from our target, then we can make progress, even if we pick the direction for each step at random. We gather feedback and apply some kind of fitness function to check to see whether we're closer or further from our target. And we discard our change if we're further uh, or work on the next small step if we're closer. I'm not suggesting that we should pick a direction at random, but even if we did, it would still work. Iteration and feedback are fundamental to learning. In fact, learning is really impossible without them. The next in my list of ideas for optimising for learning is to work incrementally. One of the biggest philosophical leaps at the heart of science is that we always assume that we're wrong. Non-scientists sometimes doubt this, but it's deeply ingrained in the culture of scientific thinking. Science doesn't talk about laws anymore, for example, only theories, because a theory can always be wrong. Engineers are the same. Look at what SpaceX are currently doing, building their Starship to take people to live on Mars. They do the calculations, run their simulations, and then they build their best guess. But part of how they do that is to allow themselves the freedom to be wrong. They make progress incrementally, step by step, limiting the radius of their wrong decisions. And then they design their systems in ways that make it possible to change them when they do make a mistake. Working incrementally means that we don't create complex systems in one giant leap of genius. We create them in many, many small steps. Each one a chance to explore and learn. What this means in practice, in software, is that we need to work in ways that allow us to make mistakes. If we're wrong, it should be relatively easy to take a step back and to try something else. This philosophy has a deep impact on how we design things, but fundamentally it be begins with us assuming that our guesses are probably wrong, rather than assuming that our job is to think of some perfect solution from the start. We design and code the best next step that we can think of, but in a way that we can correct it when it's wrong. This leads us to the next idea in my list, working experimentally. If we're working in small steps, gathering information on these steps to see if we're making progress and building our systems incrementally, bit by bit, then it's a small step to working experimentally. Experiments in software take many different forms. Each test we write can be thought of as a mini experiment. And if we do that, we tend to write better tests. But we can go further. Each change that we put into production is also an experiment, or it can be. If we observe the problem to understand it, form a model of what's going on, create a hypothesis, make a prediction from that model and then test it. That's an experiment and also probably the best possible way to improve your products and code.
The real additions that working experimentally bring are making a prediction of the outcome and controlling the variables in our experiments so that we can understand the results. Making a prediction tells us the most eff effective things to test. It also crucially forces us to stop and think more clearly about what it is that we're doing. Controlling the variables is at the heart of working experimentally. It's the difference between a good experiment and a bad one. Version control, continuous delivery and infrastructure as code are all deeply grounded in attempting to control the variables. But the scope of our tests and properties like the modularity of our designs are also doing the same thing. The last in my list for learning is empiricism. In engineering, our models don't need to be perfect. They only need to be good enough. If I'm building a website for my mum's cake shop, I probably don't need to evaluate it with the same level of precision as if I'm building software for a pacemaker or a flight control system. But I still need to work iteratively, gather feedback, explore the problem with experiments and evolve the system incrementally over time. The world will always surprise us, so we need to build our systems, even for cake shops, so that the surprises won't kill us. And when we learn something new from a surprise, we should be able to react to that learning and enhance our system incrementally as a result. Modern aeroplanes are ridiculously safe, but that safety grew incrementally over a century of empirical learning. Disasters taught us how to do better. We should defend our ability to do the same in software. If, you're all, if you organise all of your work to be iterative, feedback-driven, incremental, experimental and empirical, you will be doing a better job than if you don't, whatever it is that you're doing. In addition to being a problem of learning and discovery, though, software development is also about dealing with extremely complex systems. Even trivial applications these days are probably running on an operating system made of, made of millions of lines of code, sitting, sitting on a computer comprised of tens of billions of transistors. And if your code runs in the cloud, it's part of the most complex human creation on the planet. So in addition to becoming expert at learning, we also need to become expert at managing complexity. One of the interesting, maybe disturbing aspects of software development is how easy it is to take a tiny step and find ourselves in the midst of massive complexity. If you create a branch or start a new thread or decide to run part of your system on a second computer, these things dramatically increase the complexity, or at least they could. So software is fragile in strange ways. I have another five things ideas that allow us to manage the complexity of our systems. They are modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction and coupling. These five ideas are deeply linked to each other and to the five ideas that help us to learn. Fundamentally, all five of these tools for managing complexity are focused on one thing, giving us the freedom to compartmentalise our systems. These are the tools that allow us to break our system into pieces so that we can make changes in one place without change, that change affecting another. And so that we can read and easily understand the code in the context that we're interested in, the module or function. The readability of our systems is a key attribute of our ability to make incremental progress. We make readable code by moving the ideas that are unrelated further apart, modularity and moving the ideas that are related closer together, cohesion. By drawing lines in our systems that are meaningful and distinct using the techniques of abstraction and separation of concerns, by taking these boundaries more seriously and defending them so that once again a change in one part of the system doesn't leak out and affect another. We can do that by thinking about and managing the coupling between these pieces. There is no cookie-cutter solution here, no one-size-fits-all. These properties are somewhat fluid and there are trade-offs to be made in the balance between them. This is the skill of software design. But let me pose this question. Imagine two versions of the system that you work on most. Whatever the technology, whatever the problem it solves, one version has no modules, no cohesion, 
all of the concerns are together in one place. Data is shared freely throughout the system, maybe through lots of global variables. There's no clear demarcation, no real organization of the code that you could easily describe. My bet is that we'd be scared to change this code. Now imagine a second version that is modular, broken into separate pieces, each focused on solving a specific part of the problem. It's cohesive. Elements of the system that are closely related are close together in the code. It has good separation of concerns. Each part of the code, each module or function, is focused on doing one thing and only one thing. To achieve this separation and to aid the modularity and cohesion, the code is organized. There are models, abstractions. These models allow us to think about and focus on one part of the problem at a time, while knowing that the other parts are there, but without having to worry about how they work. Now, the first version is not really too much of an exaggeration. I see big commercial systems that look a lot like this all of the time. I'm sure that if you have been working in software development for any time, you've seen those systems too. I'm also pretty sure that every one of us would prefer to work in the second code base. Using these five ideas is how we get to build that second type of system. As a result, it's easier to understand, easier to test, easier to change, and so easier to incrementally evolve into something better. I don't mean any of these ideas as some kind of academic observation. I mean them concretely as tools that we can use to drive us towards better outcomes. Values that we accept and agree on as measures of what good really means in software. From my personal experience, I know that I can use these ideas to help me solve problems that I've never seen before. I inform all of my software-related decisions based on these ideas. Does this tech help me to improve the modularity or separation of concerns? Does it allow me to iterate faster or collect better feedback? If I make these design choices, does it allow me to ignore detail in other parts of the system? I think that these are tools that can guide you in every circumstance, whatever the technology, whatever the nature of your problem. If you work to maximize these properties of your dev process and system, you will be able to write better software faster. And if you can't do that, whatever it is that you're doing doesn't count as software engineering. More on all of this is in, available in my new book, and I do hope that you find it helpful. Thank you very much for watching.